So welcome uh, to all of you, for those just joining, uh, to this, which is the second in the series, which is called Finding Your Campfire. Now, um, some of you I know are familiar with uh, my broader work and some of you aren't. So I'm trying to, um, I don't want to spend too long setting the context, but I just want to give you a quick context around this. Um, my work explores the context of the social age and really looks at the intersection of formal and social systems. So the world of work and then the social communities that flow through and around that. And clearly we're in fairly unprecedented times, particularly a lot of people being pushed into uh, remote working spaces. So I wanted to draw upon a few threads of my broader work to try to put together a, a concise and I hope quite practical um, guide to finding your campfire. There were three, um, three webinars in this series, and this is the second. The first one yesterday was called Packing Your Backpack. And it's about those of us who are moving into remote work. So it looks at an individual perspective. We talked about how we create our space, how we understand time and set boundaries, how we maintain our energy and momentum, and how we care for others as we do so. Uh, the second webinar, this one, is about leading the expedition, but it, I'm talking about leadership in the context of my broader work, so social leadership. So not simply those of you who have a management position, not simply those who within the hierarchy lead from the front, but also all of us in terms of our um, responsibility to each other and the ways that we invest and care for our communities. So very much about social leadership. Tomorrow is kind of the session, sorry, not tomorrow, Friday is kind of a session which I'm almost most looking forward to um, because it was the thought that crossed my mind when I put this series together. And that one is about being together apart. So as we move out of the office, what do we lose in terms of culture, in terms of trust, and in terms of our shared story? So tomorrow is going to be about how we maintain that sense of being together as we are um, stretched far apart. So that's uh, the journey that we're going. But today uh, I'm gonna talk about social leadership. Okay, so um, you'll have seen, uh, I'm obviously using a, a metaphor of um, the expedition about uh, a journey that we're making. And uh, my own understanding of this is that it might be quite a long journey. Uh, I know that uh, for those of us in different parts of the world, our political leaders may have views on how long or short this journey may be, but um, we're hunkering down for uh, the long haul here. So really one focus of our work is about sustainability. How will we find sustainable ways of working when many of the pillars and boundaries that we're so used to have been fractured? So uh, I, I have my 11 month old son, uh, who's fortunately just gone to sleep, my partner who's amazingly looking after him so that I can be with you uh, at the moment for this session. I know many of you are in that situation. Uh, many of you um, trust together with partners and housemates, trying to work, trying to fit three days into one, two days into one. So this session is about leadership beyond the system. So when we're in an office, we have uh, leadership, we have management, we have a hierarchy, uh, we have separated spaces um, that we lead within. But as teams move to be remote, we don't tend to take much of that structure and baggage with us. Normally, I would say that uh, the more social the space, the more democratised the power that sits underneath it. So whilst formal systems, the organisations that we exist within tend to be reasonably stable structures of power. Our social systems tend to be far more fluid and contextual. And this shift can cause a lot of uncertainty and it can, it can work both ways. Um, some people can plow on as if nothing much has changed except the scenery. Some people may start to explore the boundaries of this new space. Um, starting to look at, for example, um, the channels that they're working on, the hours that they're working, the ways that they're working. We see a general fragmentation 
as we move into models of remote working. And certainly the evidence is clear that not everybody will thrive in this place. Some people will miss the social structure and reinforcement and validation of the office uh, to the point where they uh, become weakened or damaged by being out of it. Some people will be unable to maintain boundaries. So their work and social and family life will all become one, which generally will result in an overwhelming amount of work and an inability to turn the dial down or indeed to turn it off sometimes. So whilst in a typical view of management, our role may be about resource allocation, about setting tasks, about monitoring performance. As we move into more remote models of working, we still need to do some of that, but we start to take on increasingly important additional responsibilities. And it's to do with the health of the system, the health of individuals and the health of our communities and teams. And recognizing that sometimes our purposeful activity, so the things that we do at work to achieve tasks to deliver projects, cannot be done without attending to the social fabric and structure of the organization. So where are we now? Well, uh, to stick with my exploring metaphor, um, we used to be in the office looking out and now we've kind of climbed out and we are dispersed. So in these early stages, um, there's typically a lot of excitement, there's a lot of change, there's a lot of establishment of spaces as we talked about yesterday. Um, but we will have to consciously and actively work on the ways that we maintain our health, our well-being to continue in sustainable ways. I would rather say let's focus on sustainability from the start and be proved wrong when we're all back in the office in three weeks time than to think that sustainability is something we can pick up down the line when people are starting to flounder or sink. So that's our challenge. You know, we understand what an office is, but now we are in a new space and what has changed? Is it just the scenery or have we lost something else? Now, um, two things quickly to mention here. The first is, please bear with me as this is new work. You're the first group I'm telling this story to. So if sometimes I'm hesitant or trip over myself, it's because uh, I'm finding the narrative. And um, the second thing I wanted to say, because I just recognized a few new names coming in and I know some of those names are friends who are working in the NHS. So uh, we're obviously just going to give you a bit of a, a, a shout out, recognizing the pressure uh, that you're under there. So I just want to say that at the start so I don't run out of time at the end. Now, we have got a little bit of interactivity. Uh, I'm going to introduce Ankalad here, who's going to give us a little activity you can do if you can access um, Menti, which is an online polling tool. And uh, Ankalad, can I hand over to you just to ask that question to the group that you've got lined up? Yeah, of course. Thanks, Julian. Um, I'll share my screen with you in just a moment. Um, and what we'd like to do is just think about, as Julian's been talking there, about the changing environments that we're all experiencing and the types of changing roles that we might need as well, is to think about the differences between the types of power that you might need to draw upon during this time. So Julian's already talked about what the sort of things you might do with your formal power are, especially during your normal operating practices. But in this new environment, what is something that you can only achieve through your social power? And to answer the question, you go to menti.com, menti with an I, and it'll ask you for an access code. And that code is displayed on the screen now, and it's 559627. Many of you were here yesterday and were already used to this platform, and I can see you're already jumping in with answers. If you're having any trouble accessing, you can either ask Sam for some help or just put an answer in the chat and we'll, we'll look at those as well. So if those start to, um, start to flow in, we'll just sort of uh, see what we've got. Trust obviously has jumped right in here and trust is a very interesting thing. We've done a lot of um, quite large scale research around this, looking at how trust is held uh, for individuals within communities and teams and into organizations. And certainly we see that the move to remote 
can lead to a fracturing in trust. That's in fact a, a subject that we're going to explore in depth on, on Friday's webinar where we talk about being together apart. It's not just that we have to be together to find trust, but without trust, uh, it is easier for, uh, sorry, without being together, it's easy for trust to become diluted. Things which are achieved through social power, um, empathy, uh, absolutely, empathy is one of the social currencies of the organization. Um, joy, very true, you can't order somebody to be joyful. Negotiating around the rules is interesting. Um, in my own work in various communities, from military to, to government to healthcare, people describe very clearly how they are effective by operating around the rules within the arms of a community. So the specific leadership capability is building the communities which can help you to remain safe as you learn to be effective. Um, the human connection, which just came through there, human connection talking, asking how people are, absolutely very much the function of a social leader is to attend to the social fabric of the organization, not in a mechanistic way, so it's not about making sure you ask everybody one question every day, but it's about, as we talked about yesterday, looking for the silent areas. So every time you hear a loud voice asking yourself, who am I not hearing today? Every time you hear a dominant narrative, a story that's being told widely, think who is left out of this story, who is excluded. Um, I'm going to jump back if I can. Thank you. Let me just um, bring my slides back up here. We've got a lot to cover today, so uh, I'll try to keep a little bit of pace. So if we think about this type of social authority, um, I'll give you a, a, one way of explaining it is this, your employment contract, your job title, gives you a type of power within a system. Um, but your reputation, the authenticity of your action, the way that you are with others gives you a different type of power. And it's a different type. It's not an extension of your formal power. It's a parallel type of power. So formal power operates within the formal system and is very good for achieving the things that systems do well. However, social power and authority is contextual, it's consensual, it's given to you by others. So your formal power comes from your employment contract and is backed up by the organization. Your social power is granted by your community should you earn it. And so that's really one of the central messages for today. As we move remote and as we start leading and being led and leading socially in dispersed communities, we must pay some attention to earning the leadership that we want, to earning that power. One way of looking at this, it's sometimes in, in my work, in my illustrations, I kind of use the squares to represent formal power and authority and structure and the, the circles represent more community and social power. We could view it like this, that the, your formal structural power, your team structures, your organizational structures frame your ability to be effective but they don't give you the ability to be effective. Effectiveness is very often rooted within that social cohesion and structure, within our many overlapping communities. In the Conditions for Community Research, a large-scale research project in the National Health Service in the UK, people identified on average that they are a member of 15 different communities on a daily basis to help them to be effective. And some of those communities map closely against the formal structures of the organization, teams and so on. But some of them are entirely hidden. And in fact, people described that their most effective communities, the communities that helped them to be effective on a daily basis were very often entirely hidden and they had been invited into those communities, communities that help them to make sense of the world around us. And I feel fairly sure that you, like me at the moment, are seeing a a flurry of activity in multiple channels of people making sense of things. And sense making typically consists of curation. You know, here's an article, here's a story, here's a video. 
but then interpretation this is what i think of it this is how it stacks up against other things this is how valid it is now those things happen within communities and our role as social leaders can be to help to bring balance to those communities if you see a predominance of one type of story maybe your role is to curate alternative opinions typically our role as a social leader is not to impose a story. You cannot make a system safe. You cannot make people trust you. You cannot make a context fair. You can only create the conditions in which those things may emerge. Now, I mentioned stories, the way that stories are shared. And one of the things that I wanted to focus on today is uh, in our role as social leadership, we sit within these types of systems. So uh, our, our, our social units, sometimes I call them our tribal units, tend to fire stories out. We do it individually and we do it collectively. We fire stories at each other. Um, some of them are small and safe stories, asking about family, asking about the weather, talking about what's going on. Some of them are big and complex stories. But the thing to remember is this, stories are powerful because we relate to them. They are really the basic unit by which we transmit cultural information. So here in the UK, as we are newly locked down, we are sharing our stories of how we are coping, how we are thriving, how we are struggling. And we're doing that in many small and private channels, as well as big public and open ones. But the thing to remember about stories is that no matter how well intentioned we are, our stories typically do violence to others, stories carry a violence within them, the people who are not included within them, the, the people who sit outside it. So violence you know, can be carried as an active thing, but it can also be a, a matter of neglect. And perhaps part of our role in leading newly remote teams is not simply to pick up on the loud stories that we hear, but to think about who's being left out of these stories. So an example would be in the noise and excitement of moving to virtual, are groups of people such as, for, you know, for example, people just coming back from maternity leave or people with underlying health conditions, are they being silenced even further than they may be within a normal system? So we know that even in our legacy normal world of work, some people are disenfranchised and disadvantaged. So we will have to pay ever more attention uh, to that in our newly remote spaces. Now, I'm talking about um, social structures and stories. And one of the things I find most interesting around these spaces is to understand the currencies that operate the social currencies of the organization and i'll go into this in a in a bit more detail um, in a minute but i'm going to ask you to answer this question first of all so i'll just i'll hand over to uh and Khaled to bring up another uh, word cloud this time so i think we're looking for sort of single word answers but Ankalad, would you like to can you, uh... absolutely um I will just share the screen, but it's back to Menti, everybody. So if you're already on there, the code doesn't change. I just changed the question. Um, and straightforwardly, what can't you buy with money? You can't buy love. Absolutely. You can't buy friendship, respect, cooperation, happiness. Um, can't buy empathy. can't buy passion. Um, pride is really interesting. Um, if you look at how people spend pride, they typically describe the number one place they find pride is in the achievements of others within their tribe. So people within their closest social structures, when we see those people being successful, we feel pride in their success. The second most common place we feel pride is in helping them to be successful. And typically only the third place that people find pride is in their individual achievements. And you know, what that tells me is that we have this innate desire 
to invest in the social structures around us. But remember what I said, it's those closest social units. So if you looked at the broadest social structure of our organization, if you cut it in half, you would probably find a whole series of overlapping, but only loosely connected tribal structures, all of which look after each other. They're trust-based, they are full of kindness and empathy, but kindness and empathy to those people within their tribe. So it's easy to be fair to those people that we like. It's easy to hear the stories of those people within our close community. But perhaps part of our role in this new world is not just to support those local tribes, not just to support the people we like telling the stories that we enjoy, but also to think how will we support communities of opposition and difference and dissent? Because the thing we know for sure is that a healthy social system will maintain a whole range of views, some of which we might not like very much. But conformity around one view can be a weakness. If we view our community as a sense-making entity, we probably want to ensure that it has a range of views and opinions. So a lot of things that you can't buy with money, the sense of belonging, morality doesn't come from money. Creativity doesn't come from money. Friendship doesn't come from it. Self-awareness doesn't come from it. Honesty doesn't come from it. You know, there's a huge amount of stuff here. I'm going to um, just take us back to think about that. Now, let me just... Uh, I'm sorry for laughing out loud, but the toilet paper and the pasta comments did make me chuckle. <laughs> my toilet paper for money. Yeah, that's really true. I missed that one. So um, if you can't buy these things for money, what is going on? Well, let me give you one view. And this is a simplification. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a way of looking at it. You know, the, the, historically, the organization, the formal organization works on this triangle of time, utility and money. So give me eight hours of your time to do the thing you know how to do and I will pay you to do it. That's kind of how organizations work, time, utility, <clears throat> and money. But there's a parallel exchange going on, the social currencies. <coughs> I knew I had to cough, but don't freak out. Uh, I'm not infectious over Zoom. Um, I've just been talking too much today. The social currencies of gratitude, pride, trust, there's a whole host of social currencies, indeed, most of the social currencies were the things that you were describing in that, um, in that word cloud. And it's likely that a healthy organization, be it in an office or be it remote, trades in all of these currencies. It certainly trades in money and utility because that's the thing that lets the organization be effective. But the social structure trades in these other currencies and there's a really interesting thing here. Um, they have a very uneasy relationship with money. So an economist would tell you that many of these are honorific currencies and honorific currencies are ones which are validated, which are minted by the social community itself. So trust is an obvious example. You cannot buy trust, but furthermore, if I try to buy trust, you will probably trust me even less. Love, of course, is another example of a social force. You cannot buy love. Um, and indeed, should you try to do so, uh, it will probably backfire. Not that I'm an expert. But um, the thing about social currencies is they are actively eroded if we try to game the system. Typically, people say that they are earned through authentic action. Um, authenticity, uh, which is the way we judge the validity of the storyteller is what counts. So as social leaders, we have an obligation to the organization to maintain its mechanisms of effect. So even though many organizations are taking a hit in terms of effectiveness by the move to remote working, part of our responsibility is to help the organization be effective. But a large part is to enable the transaction of social currencies. And 
I've asked this question, you know, where is the central bank? Because the funny thing is that uh, organizations can trade in social currencies. They can award respect, they can award gratitude, they can trust people, but they don't own the central bank. So I could go to an employer and say, could I please have a 15% pay rise? And they would probably say no. But if I acted with fairness towards my community consistently over time, the community may well award me greater gratitude, greater trust. So I can earn social currencies and nobody can stop me doing it. Indeed, if organizations try to stop you, it may actively enforce um, your ability to earn it. Many people find power in their opposition to a system. So as we move remote, we should understand social currencies and start to actively trade in them. Now I'm just going to pause to have a look here. I've got a few questions who have um, come in. Uh, Nicola has asked, how do we do equality, inclusion and diversity in this space, which is really important because the, I think I sort of uh, talked about this from the side earlier, the move into online spaces, the move to remote working is likely to empower and enable some and leave some people further behind. So I guess we have two conversations. One is our ability to step outside the system and look down upon it. Even though I know you're all busy, you know, we're very busy and nobody's going to give you any more time. But our ability to step outside and say, whose voice can I not hear? Who is remaining silent? Uh, who is being excluded? And to reach out to find those voices is part of our uh, responsibility as a social leader. And I'll come back onto that point um, slightly later. Uh, and I'm just going to come to Cam's, uh, sorry, I, I remember you can't read the questions. I can read the questions. So I'm going to read this question out. Cam has asked uh, a follow on question from yesterday's session. How can I support my team to find their workspace? when they're trying to balance work, children who need occupying, partner also working from home, a few of the people not in my line management are struggling. I, I, uh, I only have influence, I don't have any control. Well, the, the most straightforward answer I can give you to this is, is to recognize um, there is no perfect space. Uh, if any of you have achieved perfection, please let me know how. I believe that we are all on a curve of failure at the moment because we're trying to fit too many hours into not enough hours in the day. So I think the greatest thing we can do at this stage is to enable people to share stories or possibly create the space for those stories to be shared, but not just the bullish stories of success, not just people saying, I'm winning, I've mastered it, I've cracked it. Our responsibility may be to create anonymized spaces where people can share their stories of uncertainty and doubt, where people can say, I am struggling, my partner is struggling, I'm falling behind, I don't know who I can ask. But we do that as social leaders, not to respond, not to try to fix things. And if you're like me, you're a, a fixer, you see somebody hurting and you want to fix it. But sometimes our responsibility is just to hold open the space so the story can be heard, because ultimately it is only the broader community who can fix those things. So yesterday, when talking about packing your backpack as an individual, I talked about creating your space. So individually, we have to create our space. You know, we have to be set up for remote working. But as a leader of newly remote teams, we have to create our shared space. So instead of just sort of me in the tent in the woods, we're, we, we've got to create this kind of this village, this community, this campsite. So I just wanted to think about um, that a, a little bit um, and some of the factors that, that feed into this. So the first is about the role of technology. So clearly technology sits at the heart of the radical connectivity we feel in the context of the social age, which is a good and a bad thing. Yesterday we talked about the segregation of space. How will we maintain boundaries? How will we maintain a division? But today I want to talk about the more positive sides of it. How will we create space 
with technology for community. And it's that distinction that I want you to hold on to. Technology is not the end. It's the means to the end. Technology can give us an abandoned village, but community is the thing that can bring life to it. But we see that communities have an uneasy relationship with technology, especially the technologies given to them by the organization. In the global research project on the landscape of trust, and, and those of you that sort of do know my work more widely will know that I'm an evidence-based practitioner. I like to bring some evidence and rigor to the work that we do. In that work, we see clearly people say they trust technology given to them by the organization about 30% less than social technologies, which they own themselves. So put simply, people may trust Microsoft Teams given to them by the organization less than they trust WhatsApp. There are a whole host of reasons, which I don't have time to get into today about why that is. But the thing to remember is that people use many different technologies. When we talk about the office space, the organization owns the office. It tells you when it's gonna buy you a new desk, it buys you a new laptop, it buys you a desk, it buys you a coffee machine. Organizations fully control the formal, architectural, structural, asset-based space of the organization. But as we move to remote, that all fragments. So I'm willing to bet that all of you are staying in touch with quite a large number of technologies. You can throw a number into the chat if you, if you want to share it. But we are um, typically engaged with many different technologies. Indeed, when I did that research with a national health service group in the northeast of the UK and into Scotland, uh, sorry, Northeast England and into Scotland, um, I saw people reporting they used 17 different technologies to connect in order to be effective on a daily basis. But interestingly, 16 of those 17 technologies, they were expressly forbidden from using by the rules and protocols of the organization. People were connecting with different technologies because it gave them purposeful, easy to use, segregated, hidden, trusted types of spaces. So think about your role as a leader to use technology to hold a space open, but not to own the technology. I put in here a, a small piece on, 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 on um, how spaces become places. So technology can give us a space, but we as social creatures don't live in spaces. We live in communities and houses and homes. And there's a difference. You know, when I say, where are you working? You're unlikely to give me a set of grid coordinates or describe the materials that make up the structure of your building. Instead, you will say, I'm working from home. And home is a place. So technology can give us a space. It can give us an empty field to come together in. But it's only when we come together and celebrate each other, that we find a community, that we create a fair or a festival. All of our social structures are emergent, socially moderated entities. Nobody can give you community. You have to earn it together. Now, part of this means that as organizations move remote, they are likely to have to relinquish increasing amounts of control. You can plan all you like, but ultimately, you have to go where the conversation is with the permission of the people who hold those spaces. It's most likely that as your teams and as you yourselves are moving remote, you are starting to inhabit a very broad range of spaces. Yesterday, I was uh, working with a group within an organization which has its best intentions at heart. It's doing a lot of work to try to help people be successful, and yet, the group I was working with had created a WhatsApp group broadly to fret and worry and complain about the parent organization. Not because they particularly felt anything bad was being done to them, but they needed a space to let off steam and to rehearse and prototype their stories and to kind of hold each other safely. So the things that will kill us in newly emergent remote spaces are trying to maintain, maintain too much control over time, over energy, over effort, over conversations and over spaces. 
So I'll just remind you that you can post questions into the um, into the Q and A box. Uh, and I'm afraid I'm not actively monitoring the chat at the moment, but Sam, Richard and Ankalad can wave at me if, if they need me to pay attention to anything. I'll also remind you, easy to find online. If you, you know, if you're, if you're trying to do good work with your team, if you want some, some um, pointers, then just get in touch, ask the question, we can address it in a subsequent session. Um, Camilla has um, asked a question, could you give some examples of these prohibited technologies? just to know whether my workplace is also doing this. Absolutely, Camilla. So um, working with, um, well, the, the, the simple answer is social technologies will be things like WhatsApp, Facebook Messenger, Skype, um, private spaces. Formal channels will be Yammer, um, sometimes Slack, Teams, uh, and so on. Uh, your formal email um, is part of a formal space. But when you actually ask people, so when I carried out research with the Joint Special Forces Operations University in the United States, asking them about the technologies they use to solve their most intractable problems, the number one place they went to is WhatsApp, despite being forbidden from doing so. And they do that because they can curate, they can pull together a community, they can solve a problem, they can award each other recognition and respect and gratitude for doing it, and they can disperse the community. And there's no risk to their reputation. They're purposeful, they're effective because of these technologies. Okay, time keeps ticking by, so I'm gonna move on to talk about social capital. In the social leadership handbook, I wrote a whole chapter on social capital. So I'm trying to uh, pull out the most salient points here. So let me start by a definition. And there, there are many different definitions of social capital. So just accept this is a this is my personal working definition. You can you can build your own. But social capital is your ability or my ability to survive and thrive in this new space. So put simply, as the organization fragments out, as it disperses from the office into remote working, we need everybody to have high social capital. And a specific responsibility of the social leader is to build and be aware of and maintain their own social capital but crucially to help build and and develop that in other people um, it may be about helping those who are not engaged enough to come further in but sometimes it can be about helping keep people safe people who are sharing too much who are exposing themselves to risk by being too honest which is a hard thing to say can you ever be too honest but you know, it might well be in a formal organizational context, if people say, I'm, I'm struggling, I'm failing, it might be that they need a safe community to do that in. It's easy to misjudge social spaces, or indeed not to understand if a space is fully formal or is fully social. One thing you can do very usefully is to clearly articulate it. So this is a performance space, or this is a rehearsal space, or this is a social space. Again, yesterday we talked a little bit about the segregation of spaces. How will we maintain our um, how will we maintain our space for our morning coffee? Um, Verena has asked a question here. I think asking for a practical example of creating an open virtual space to assist inclusion and involve the potentially marginalised. Well, I can only give you a small story to answer that, Verena. I'm, I'm working at the moment with a, a, a uh, a friend who, who is in um, Canada working in one of the indigenous communities and is really worried about uh, the impact of the virus on the LGBT community there. And so she's trying to create a space for conversations and stories of support. Uh, LGBT too stronger is the hashtag, um, reaching out to various communities around Canada, Canada for messages, for stories. So she is curating stories of empathy and support to share into um, a minority and excluded and indeed persecuted um, part of her community. So um, the other thing I would say to your question, Rowena, how, um, how do you create a practical example of creating an open virtual space to assist inclusion? Um, focus on creating a space which is out of the ordinary. So within the everyday space, you know, a team meeting, 
you can't have that conversation because everyday spaces are governed by everyday rules. So move into, um, move into uh, alternative spaces, start small and invite people in. One other uh, quick uh, question here, Johnny has asked, what about safe spaces? Uh, a lot of people roll their eyes when they hear this at the start of a meeting, absolutely. Um, the thing about safe spaces is that um, a safe space will be a judgment which is imposed upon you, not an aspiration that you state. So if people discover that they are safe within a space, they will judge it to be a safe space. But it's like saying, trust me, trust me, Johnny, you can definitely trust me. I can say it all I like, but until you have experience that I am not betraying you, you won't trust me. So we, we have to earn these badges that we, that we seek. So, oh, sorry, specifically in this context, one of our responsibilities as a social leader is to think about who is left behind. And I'm conscious that a number of the questions coming in here are about this, they're about exclusion and about, um, uh, about in, ensuring that. Uh, so the, the phrase I put here is silent failure. Uh, we're not looking for the people who are shouting that they're failing. And we're not listening too much to the people who are shouting that they're succeeding. We're watching and actively seeking out those whose voice we cannot hear. Beware of people who just slowly and through attrition get left behind. One point I did want to raise here, which is important, this work comes out of, um, this illustration comes out of work on fairness. How do we maintain individually a fairness in our action? And it's to say, um, social leaders do what's right, not just what's easy. And sometimes that means standing up to the organization itself. And I'll give you a, an example or a context to put around this. So um, I think many organizations are well-intentioned at this stage. They are faced by an unprecedented challenge. They have people with families, with care requirements, with illness in their household, with worry, with concern, with mental health conditions. Um, people who are you know, worried about all sorts of things. They, they are saying that they want to do what's right. And indeed, they are probably trying to do what is right. But as a social leader, we may have to stand up and do what's right, not just go along with the line of the organization. It is your responsibility to champion those who do not ask to be championed, but may need that level of support. It's likely to be the hardest part of our role as social leaders to stand in opposition to a system. But if we don't do that, we perpetuate inequality. Okay, I want to um, think about recognition and, um, and respect. So thinking more about the social currencies of the organization and our role in leading the expedition our role as social leaders. Now, um, one of the most powerful things we can do is to share gratitude. Gratitude is one of the strongest social currencies of the organization. But it might be that we um, think about where the power lies in that. Uh, one of the, the projects I did, which I, I sort of really enjoyed the most, was working in one of the police forces, um, working with more senior leaders in the organization to reach out into their networks, to hear really small stories of where people had carried the values of that police force into their community and to write them a postcard. So it's a message from one person to one other person in a very low tech way. And their postcard would say, I just wanted to say, I heard you do this thing. You know that I'm trying to achieve this strategic aim. And I think that thing you did in this tiny way on one day to one person in our community carried our values forward and I want to thank you for that work and that's important because the social fabric of the organization is stitched with many tiny knots which are distributed throughout and sometimes the engagement of one person to one person can be most powerful but the second thing I asked them to do on those postcards was to share some vulnerability to say and I wonder if you could spare me 10 minutes for a phone call so that I could talk about something I'm uncertain of in my own work. So 
Your strength as a social leader may be held in your willingness to share your uncertainty and doubt. To say, I might be senior in the organisation, but I don't have all the answers and I'm quite fearful of getting it wrong. It's easy to bluster. It's easy to believe that strength comes from projecting invulnerability. But of course, failure comes from projecting invulnerability. Strength is our willingness to share our own fallibility and have a humility to work with others um, to become stronger together. One of the um, most important skills for any kind of leader is that of story listening, the ability to hear stories but not respond to them. We're conditioned by the systems of our organisations to respond, to hear something and say, yes, we've got a solution to that, we've got a group for that, we've got a project for that, we've got an answer to that, we've got an opinion on that. But sometimes we should just listen and say, thank you for sharing your story. We should have the humility to respect and recognize alternative views, alternative stories, not to colonize them and not to own them. But story listening is difficult when for many of us, our power historically has come from our ability to conform with and carry forwards a formal narrative. At this time, more than anything, we should respect failure in ourselves and respect it in others really clearly. So people who are missing targets, who are sinking, who are struggling, we should actively and publicly recognize them and respect how much they are trying and hold them safely in that failure. So an important thing to do as we think about awarding recognition and respect is ask yourself will i respect people for success will i congratulate people who are successful or are we going to take a view that we will congratulate the effort if somebody is only able to put in three useful working hours a day but they're doing so against a backdrop of extreme social upheaval and pressure should we be thanking them for doing that how do we have to understand how that stacks up against the 12 hours you make doing but we can only each operate to our potential we can only operate um, as far as we are able and we have to uh, hold people safely as we do so okay so um, i would encourage you to throw any questions in if you have any questions or comments you can throw them in the q a box or the chat now, I did promise that I would give some practical um, tips, suggestions from uh, these sessions. So I'm going to give you my three um, tips around, uh, around leading the expedition. So as we sort of look through that window, as our organisations disperse, what are the things that we need to do? Well, firstly, assume we're in it for the long haul and take the action invest in your community to earn social authority over time so in in my own work on social leadership I, I look at this link between the reputation that you earn and the social authority that you are awarded this is the time to be earning reputation we are all busy but your ability to reach out and take the action that needs to be taken is what will earn you the reputation and pioneer fairness. So we are in a space where we are not clear uh, what the rules are. We may not even be clear how to be fair in these spaces. How are we fair to people who are caring? How are we fair to people who are grieving? How are we fair to people who are struggling for money? How are we fair for people who have other competing important responsibilities around family? So pioneer it, be unafraid to say that we don't know, but be unafraid to take action. And of course, be unafraid to stand up and do what is right. Secondly, develop yourself. So support others, seek out silence, develop yourself. The times when we are busiest are the times when we tend to rely on the things we already know how to do. But what if we need to be learning new things? At this time when we're possibly busiest, 
and have the least free time, perhaps this is the very time we should be seeking out just in a small way. Maybe it's only an hour a week where we can join a sense making community where you can work towards something where you can, um, uh, I was trying not to put this in the language of learning, but where you can be metacognitive, where you can take yourself out of the system and look down upon the system where you can take yourself out of the busyness and look down upon the busyness and observe it and reflect on it and work with the community to learn to do something differently about it. If learning is a luxury we save till the times we're not busy, then we will be failing to learn the most obvious thing, which is that yesterday's skills and abilities will give us the results we had yesterday. And as the context of work changes, unless you're more brilliant than me, and everybody else in your community, we will have to learn the new things. I would normally say it's a safe bet that we all have amongst us with our collective brilliance, 50% of what we need to be successful. So take the time yourself to learn some of the other 50% and give the time to others and learn to listen, recognize your role as a storyteller. Now I'm going to hand over to Ankarad in a minute who's going to um, ask you a question but Joe here has asked any hints and tips of the timing to provide spaces for health workers who are very busy and have competing priorities uh, and I have to say Joe I just don't know um, all I can tell you is that we have in this group here and across some of the other programs I'm running at the moment we have busy um, people working in the health sector who are able to carve out time um for um you know for that reflective space what i would also see typically if we observe communities under pressure is they tend to self-organize so maybe you can create a space and ask communities to nominate somebody that can take time out to be part of that community um, it's the best i can give you at the moment um, mandy has asked the question uh, is our role a story listener not storyteller well, it's kind of both. So when I, uh, when I wrote the book on social leadership in 2014, the Social Leadership Handbook, through all of its 15 or 16 different drafts of the manuscript, right up almost until the point of publication, it was called the Storytelling Leader. It was only at the last minute I changed the name to the Social Leadership Handbook. So our role as social leaders is to, thanks Rich, waving the book. <laughs> our role as social leaders is to, uh, is to tell stories and to help others tell stories. But additionally, it's to be an expert story listener. Okay, Ankarad, over to you. Okay, we just wanted to ask the same question we asked at the end of yesterday's session. Um, so if you jump back over to Menti and Julian, if you don't mind giving us the uh, share, screen sharing, that would be great. And the question is, Thinking back over today's session, what one thing will you change today, tomorrow, next week, in whatever time frame is realistic for you? And that code is 559627, in case you've already jumped out of Menti. So um, just in our last few minutes, and I'll make sure we finish spot on time, I'll just try to um, respond to some of these. Somebody's saying, I will write, and I will try to inspire people. The greatest thing I've ever done in my own practice is learning how to write every day because it lets me try out all the ideas and discover which ones are any good um, and most of them aren't of course most of them have to iterate and be reworked many times the process of writing has changed how i think i will become a story listener it's a fantastic thing and it's fantastically hard to do um, but it's really powerful if you can be the person who builds a reputation for helping people tell their stories, for picking their stories up, for carrying them into different communities. That's a powerful place to be. Seek out a voice I haven't heard. It ties in with the thing I said yesterday. Look around you, make sure within your remote team that you are aware when you hear cheering, when you hear shouting, think who is silent. It's, it's our ability as a, a, a social leader is our ability to recognize in ourselves when we are just listening to loud 
voices and dominant stories and then to actively go out and seek out those voices which have been lost again more people saying um uh seeking out silent spaces suggesting that the teams check in with each other um i'll remind you that the uh, the session yesterday on packing your backpack um is repeated three more times uh, i think somebody will will i think there'll be a follow-up email to this which will have the links uh, to that um, somebody said meditate the thing that will change meditate quite right give yourself the time um, even be it a few minutes the thing about um, the, the thing about control is if you do nothing to take control circumstance will sweep you along um, so even if it's only a few minutes that you take and and actively consciously do something with you are at least creating a sense of control um, okay so that's great there's a whole range of things going through here to encourage you to um, reflect back on this over the next few days as you are caught up in the busyness um, and could I, could I just grab back the um, just grab back for a minute screen and I'm just going to share this and just wrap us up for today I just want to thank you all for um, for being here today uh, letting me rehearse this new story I hope it's been um, okay I'll just remind you the next session on Friday is about being together apart it really looks at how we maintain culture and social fabric and structure um, in our newly remote teams if you have questions if you need support uh, do reach out so i think i will um wrap up just by uh saying this in a unprecedented times we are going to need to find new ways of being and i think we should recognize that whilst government can give us a, a, a industrial response it is you and me who can create a compassionate, humble and kind society and organisation that will enable us to carry forward those things which will see us through these times. It is through our actions every day. I normally say it's um, that, you know, the journey to kindness is 10,000 steps and somebody is going to have to take the first one and if it's not me it's you and if it's not you it's me but if neither of us take it we will never make the journey okay so thank you for joining me today uh, thanks again especially to those of you um, working on the the front lines here uh, we're definitely grateful for your hard work and support thanks for joining hope to see you uh, on friday for the next session okay thanks very much everyone